So you get the idea of rules-based approach. This is what, you know, my students liked at the time. This would have been 1981 or two, so we're going to But I, after I heard that the second time, probably the third time, I stopped getting so proud of myself for having used a rules-based approach that is programming all these separate rules in to do these things, saying that here I had, after all this work, a piece of software that made up interesting bot corrals that sounded pretty trashy because of that MIDI connection there. But it couldn't do anything else, and I was no closer to finishing my opera was than when I started the software. And so I was damning myself for having taken a, a trip down the wrong, uh, wrong path. So let me tell you about recombinancy, what I thought that I learned from all this. I decided whoa, that I should start with the music itself, uh, that all my work should be data dependent. And I got this, this dream in my head that I was going to make music that, if you can imagine this, it was built on a huge database. And Bach wrote well over 400 corrals. I think I used 220 or so in the database. Okay. And then on top of that, I wanted to write a little analysis module that would analyze the music in that database to produce new examples of Bach corrals. But, wonderfully enough, what was, what was perfect for me was that I could then take the Bach corrals out, if it, if it worked, and put in COPE. And without any alterations to the software, it would produce COPE. And my opera would be done in no time flat. <laughs> that was the idea. Or I could put in Brahms or Beethoven or somebody else. So that was my dream. Now, with this performance, this performance, I wonder what my voice went up here. I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting excited about this, that's why, I don't know. Um, so with this performance, you're going to find it just as damn screwy and stupid sounding as the other. And this is a real bop, huh? This is real, what I'm doing here. <laughs> uh, so this is from Bach Corral, the beginning of Bach Corral 237 measures one and two. Check it if you'd like. Okay, if anybody has a Riemann Schneider around here, you can do that. So you can, it's going to sound pretty bad with the MIDI. The MIDI does not sound good. But this is the first phrase of his corral. I'm going to show you what I did to write new music, uh, new Bach Corrals. So, that's the song. Okay, that is Bach. It's obviously a little more exciting than what, what Emmy did with his rule-based approach. Uh, some action in the bass part, some little examples of ornamentation that is so particular in Bach used in only certain spots, usually just before cadences, not always. Certain passing tones in certain areas. Bach followed pretty much most of his rules. By that I mean, you know, you're taught in school. We taught our students to be as boring as possible. You can look at the, you know, the alto voice, what the hell, and you can do that in your sleep. You can memorize it right now. Look at the soprano voice during the first measure. Da, 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 da. Same pitch each time. Doesn't really matter. I mean, in fact, in this case, Bach used for all of his soprano lines in the first phrases with somebody else's music. It was usually something from the, uh, you know, from the Lutheran hymnal or something that congregation or the choir already knew. And he was just supplying the other three lines, and then he was supplying the rest of the chorale's uh, material. But I want to play that again because you're gonna, you're gonna. It's very short, and you put you through all this. Um, I want you to get it in your ear. Okay? 
Now, here's my idea. Why make up a whole lot of notes when Bach is already in all of these corrals that I put in by hand, by the way, five parameters for each note for over 200 corrals. I was doing two corrals, usually three corrals a day, all by hand. There was no, there was no software to do that for you at that time. Uh, so it took <coughs> months to create the database. But as my wife would tell you, I'm nothing if not obsessive, so it was not a problem for me. I just <laughs> did what I had to do. I got this idea that if I took all the Bach corrals, all of them, and transposed them to C major or C minor, put them into the numbers that they were, and broke them up by beat. This is beat one, beat two, beat three, beat four. Four, four throughout. And stick them in what we call objects in an object-oriented system. And I'm not going to explain that since most of you probably already know what that means, but it's sort of like the buttons you push on, on, on things on the screen there. There you push the buttons and they they follow certain orders within the object and do whatever it is you want that button to do or whatever it says it's going to do. So I put them into objects. These objects contain, these objects you can imagine them as, as little balls or, or something. Okay, dental floss. This little dental floss has lots of floss in it. And a little thing here to cut the floss off and you got the, and a big ball of more floss so you can pull some more floss out of it. It's green. It's got all kinds of attributes. Okay? So I put this beat here in, a, in an object like this, which can contain many attributes of what was originally in the music here. And so these, were, these I turned into numbers and said, okay, all right, this is 55, that is 53. This note is 70, not 71. This note is 59, this note is 62, that note is 67. MIDI note transpos you know, that's simple MIDI stuff. You don't even know it, those are the notes that MIDI is, numbers that MIDI's ascribed to those notes. Put those all in here, including this extra one here, okay? Now, I'm gonna tell that, f this first beat. Okay, now, remember this, remember where you are, you're on the first beat of Bach Chorale, 237, so that, that can be, if you wish, I've never done this before, this is all, I, I've never done this in any presentation, used, <laughs> used uh, a, a uh, dental floss box, but it, it works, it, yeah. it's gonna make it, okay? So, instead of the winding up of the dental floss in time, I'm gonna say, okay, not only are you the first beat of this corral with those pitches in it, and this one coming off the beat, and those durations in it, which would be 500, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 500, totaling a thousand. These are all microseconds. But that the beat following you, and this is the key point here, the beat following you contains the notes 52, 60, 64, 67. Now knowing what this one is, is really important. So we'll put that inside. That's not going to be used except, as you'll find out, as a real core to how the program works. It's incredibly simple. So, I store the stuff that's to be played, and I store the stuff, the information, not this guy, just what happens here. On the belief, and please get this, on the belief that if you take all of these chords, these thousands of different chords in Bach Corrals, after you transposed all the music to C major, there's going to be more than one chord that looks exactly like that. And more than one chord looks exactly like that. And here too. And I put these in what I call lexicons. So there's a lexicon of well, we'll call them by their own names now, G in that register, 
B in that register, actually sounding down here because of the A here, D in that register, G in that register, and it goes to this. Now, so I've got a whole slew of blue dental floss, G, B, D, G, okay? Dominant chords in the, C, in the key of C major. Now you'll have to imagine I've got another dental floss, and I don't have one, <laughs> another one here. But if I had one, it, let's say it's red. It's this chord. Okay? Now, here's the key. More than red, one red chord exists. So I'm going to put all the green dental floss in a lexicon, a bag full of green. That is green, isn't it? It's not blue. Okay, good. My wife keeps telling me I'm going colorblind. I don't believe it. I think that's, damn, you're green. Put it in there. Then I take, what, uh, this was red. All the red ones and put them in that one. All the, the yellow ones, just randomly yellow, and put them in that one. All the purple, put them in another bag. In another bag until I get to the end. And any of them that happen to belong in the same bag, do any of them belong in the same bag? Yep. Really? Which one? Which ones belong in the same bag? Come on, you got to work with me here. Second one. Second measure and first E, C, E, G. So these will be red. They'll both go into the red bag. So now what if I do this? What if I say, okay, I'm gonna start with this chord, and we know it goes to this chord. I'm gonna reach into the second chord box, the bag, from my, for any one of the red ones, and come up with this one. Now, is the voice leading gonna be right between these? Absolutely. Absolutely, this is gonna go down to the E like it's supposed to. This is gonna go up to the C like it's supposed to. This is going to go up to the E like it's supposed to, and the G, poor G, is going to stay there just like it's supposed to. Now, what's interesting about that is this one goes on to that one. Well, that's quite different than this one. All right? So now this one's going to go someplace else, and suddenly we got what? New Bach. It is Bach, but it isn't Bach. And what's nice about it is, at least for our purposes right now in this discussion, the Bach is being created in a way in which all the very local kinds of rules, the rules that govern chord to chord, not the rules that govern how long a phrase is or what the form is or, or that kind of stuff. That's not yet. That's going to come. But for right now, we can be guaranteed that this chorale that's going to be slowly constructed is going to be a new corral. It's going to be Bach because it is Bach, but it isn't Bach because Bach probably never did exactly that. Now, from a computational point of view, I would probably get an F in a graduate course or undergraduate course for what I just did. Okay? Because what I did was I didn't give a damn about how elegant my solution was. And that's how I work. <laughs> I got this problem. I'm going to try to find the damnest easiest way to get it done as I possibly can. And I don't give a damn what anybody thinks of my algorithm. Because it's just there to get me that. OK? Now, I'm not trying to pick on teachers of computer science here, please. Know that. It's just that. I've been in classes where that's been, the, that's been the source. I can't, well, that's another story. I'll tell you during the party if somebody wants to hear it after this, if you, if you want to hear my egregious story of, of things. But let's listen to that once again. I'm sorry to put you through it, but it's worth it to have you get this process. Now. Look at this. 
it didn't choose the first chord of the second measure as the second chord. It chose instead to go to that same chord which occurred in Bach Chorale 223, measures five and six, which as far as this chord to this chord is concerned, it's exactly the same. You'll hear it when I play this. It's exactly the same as that of Bach, but it goes someplace exceedingly different with this big, long, the mini seventh, well, no, mm -hmm. the mini seventh, yeah. <coughs> different place. Bach never wrote this. Of course, he wrote all of it, just not in this order. Ah, after listening to that first one those four times that I made you listen to it, pretty refreshing, isn't it? I'll do that twice just to show you how much. Even these poor singers going, ah, 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 it's still interesting, okay? Now, now it's continued. Why did it keep all these things the same? Well, there's all kinds of reasons for that. Uh, I don't know which, I, I have no idea of what reason it might be. One of the reasons, of course, would be that there were no substitutions for these chords until it got to here, where it went uh, to 187. So now we've got some interesting machinations going on. But we've got a, a real, another reason is that in, in the process of doing this at a larger level, I realized that music sometimes shouldn't be taken apart because the, th the things that it's taking apart are what I call signatures of the composer's style. That is, every time they went and they found themselves on a particular chord, they would do the following things. And so the program I had it already starting to look for signatures through a pattern matching device, and that pattern matching device sent it on its way to, to say, this was a signature of some kind, Bach does that an awful lot of the time. Maybe you better save that and make the first, you know, next choice to be right there. And now I'm just gonna let you follow how the phrase was made step by step without no oh, stop that <laughs> Now watch the top. It's going to be telling you where these came from. What? program is <laughs> deciding to, uh, there, you there go. we go. <laughs> Maybe I can get it done here. itself at all. No rules at all. All it does is chop the music into beats or look for signatures first and tell the program you can't break us down into beats and put them in these lexicons. Choose appropriately. It takes almost no time at all and you have a beautiful Bach Corral phrase. Follows all the rules step to step. I saw that yawn. <laughs> Better watch it. <laughs> I, I go crazy when I see yawns out there. I think I'm boring people. Now you can't stand to bore people. I get very, very weird. So watch it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a good phrase. <laughs> there, did it again. Good. Listen to it again. Now, Bach 
didn't write his corrals with just beat to beat rules of which the program knows nothing about. It's just bringing these things together in new, in new ways. For those of you who were here this morning when I spoke about musical issues of Wirtelspiel, this is making music that was not meant to be a musical Wirtelspiel into a musical Wirtelspiel. I did my idea, it never came from there, but if you remember that particular thing, it's part of that concept. But unfortunately, Bach wrote in phrases that were long enough to have some, you know, some melodic content to them, some logic to them, but not so long that half your singers would die from lack of oxygen or asphyxiation. I mean, we're, we're trying to write, you know, decent choir music. Boy, my hair is a mess. <laughs> is it that bad out there, too? <laughs> you know, just, you know, I've got to get that in there. Okay. All right. Uh, so, we've got some, some more constraints to develop. My first reaction would be, well, I know how long the phrases should be in these things, I'll just put them in. But that doesn't work. I, I, I come and say, forget the rules-based approach. Just go back and inherit that, that's the word I was using at the time, from the actual Bach chorales. So, in, so I have this out now, in my blue, but all in my red, yellow, other kinds of dental floss kits, Okay, I've got all the notes of each beat, plus the notes they're going to, which are not played, but they're actually, you know, used uh, in the new beat, which then continues some other way. Uh, I'm going to also include in this not only the the dental floss itself and so forth. I'm going to add some new ingredients to that to each one of those, no matter what lexicon they belong to, and it's going to be. Well, I'm not only the first beat of the first phrase, but I'm in a phrase that lasts three measures. And so you better watch out. When you make, a, when you make that second choice, make that second choice with some knowledge of where it belonged in its phrase. So it will act as an appropriate sort of second beat and third beat. Every one of these things is now making a more intelligent decision based on how long the phrase should be. So that this could have been that long. I mean, it was producing things go da da da. Not that Bach didn't do that once in a while, but you don't want them doing it all the time. And you didn't want one to last before you got to a half note, or in his case, a, a fermata over over the notes. You know, 20 bars in, or your singers would be passed out and not involved with anything. I got somebody going to sleep over there. You want to ask a question? Yeah, just really quickly. Are, are you referring to just one of the lines now? You, like you're taking like the, just the part, or are you talking about like taking the whole section of the whole whole section of everything? Okay. Oh no, I'm not trying to take the whole section from another piece. I'm yeah, trying to create a new a new section based on a model of the piece. In this case, where the first one came from. So in other words, this becomes a model. From I'll show you that in the next slide. Becomes a, a model or not becomes, but follows, now let me just go to the next slide. That, that'll answer your question. Here is the next slide. On the top, you'll see a Bach Corral phrase. For some reason, I haven't given this identity, but there it is. On the bottom is an Emmy construction of Bach Corral with pieces from other Bach Corrals. Okay. Now, that's the model. So it looks at that model, which just happens to be, I, I guess I didn't have to put that because that's 140 measure one. Okay? It starts off, everything's exactly the same, and then it goes off to where it's going to go. So we've got, you know, so that's 140. That's where it went. But you can see this is different. This is different. This is sort of different. This is barely different. And this is the same. So this phrase, use that phrase as a model by choosing wisely. From the, that's, that's from the third uh, Indiana Jones film. <laughs> Remember they were in that cave there and that thing like that? You've got to choose widely for the, uh, uh, for the chalice. So you make each choice now, not just because it has those notes in them, 
but because it's the second bit of the phrase, the third bit of the phrase, the fourth bit of the phrase, but this is different music, so you have to come back, you have to get that. So now we're going to listen to the Bach at the top and the one below. Here's the Bach at the top. Here's the Bach at the bottom. <coughs> Different, yet clearly, clearly based on one another. They begin and end in the same place. In the middle, it's different. Now, you're going to have to take what I said and look at this. This is hard to read, except this phrase is the top, is the first phrase in the previous slide. This is the second phrase of the previous slide. They end up in the same place. They start in the same place. Okay? They jump up to the same place. Yeah, well. I think so. I mean, it's hard to read these things, but pretty much the same thing. Now, I've left out the other phrases here because of space. I just couldn't fit it on here. So you've got to imagine that we're looking at the cadence of the second phrase, that we're looking at the cadence of the third phrase. In other words, these things which were once these little bell flosses are not bags of toilet paper. They, they are full of all kinds of enriched information about the original. Okay. So when choirs started looking at this, and all the students or adults looked at the music, they would automatically look for mistakes. And I said, don't bother. The rules didn't come from me. They came from Bach. If you find any mistakes, Bach made them, not me, okay? And believe it or not, I discovered something incredible. Bach made mistakes all over the place. All these things we were telling our students not to do, or you get an F, were wrong. How could this be? We're academics. <laughs> what we had done, of course, is we took the statistical probability of how often they did it, realized that they did it very, very rarely, but if we allowed our students to do it, they would do it all the freaking <laughs> time, and said, you can't do it at all. But somebody forgot to mention that to a lot of us who were taking theory, so when we were teaching it, we just said, you know, you can't do it. Well, Buck did everything. There are cluster chords in Bach chorales. There are some of the most incredible modulations between two chords you've ever heard in your life. That would be against every tenet of a, of a sophomore or more likely a, a freshman, fresh person, uh, uh, you know, person in, in, a, in a theory class. So it was interesting. That's, a, that's just a sidelight. Uh, Now I'm just going to flip the thing and say, okay, if you've got all that, that in each beat is all this information, and that what you're about to hear is Bach, but isn't Bach, at the same time, I'm going to play a piece that was one of the first pieces that Emmy, E-M-M-Y, ever composed.
day after the performance, both performances of this piece in Santa Cruz, I had a lecture to give at uh, Mills, and I took along uh, a tape of the concert, well, not the whole concert, a tape of the performance of, uh, of uh, this. And just to make sure I had taken the right tape, not the actual Bach, but the Emmy Bach, I stuck it in the, uh, in the, in the little tape player in my car. And after it played, I said, shit, that's the real Bach. I don't know what I'm going to do. And it wasn't until I got to Mills, and walked in, and started setting up and saying, how am I going to explain this to these people? This is a real Bach, and I've got the score for the Emmy score. And then I played the thing again. And I hadn't gone to many rehearsals, so I didn't really know how much it sounded, how it sounded. But it couldn't be this. <laughs> it was this. And I was fine. Um, big bunch of data. Little bitty analyzer. Out pops this, following no elegant process at all, except me wanting desperately to do that. Which was, by the way, write a fucking opera. <laughs> and I hadn't done one note of the thing. Thank God the person who commissioned it for five grand to help my four teenage sons by that point to stay alive, and us as parents as well, and a meager salary of a fledgling professor, um, I was able to finish the opera in two and a half days. I hadn't put all the lyrics in where they're supposed to be yet, but two and a half days, sent it off, made no comment. I've been working on it for seven years. No big deal. Went to the premiere performance, got the best reviews of my life. <laughs> and I hadn't composed it. Or had I? I'll leave it up to you to decide. If I didn't, who did? For your information, that's the, the background. Now, I'm going to play something else. You've got to realize that there are still some elements that are important. Bach chorales, the ones that you've seen so far, are really good examples of Bach chorales. But there's some things that aren't in there. What, tell me what isn't in those Bach chorales. Something we're really used to if we play music. Did you see one of these things? When you looked up, there was something missing. Dynamic markings. Well, dynamic markings, yes. But those are, in Bach, are usually left up to performers anyway. So we, we're going to, you know, Rests. say it loud. Rests. Even louder. Rests. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a single rest in all that music. So here we have music, which is always four singers singing at the same time all the time with every once in a while a fermata, meaning hold that note. So I don't have to write a half note. I'm going to put the little fermata. We call them bird's eyes. And if you're a composer or if you're a performer playing it, that's what you're looking for. So now the program has got to do some other things. It's got to take into account what happens when music of different textures is played or is composed by somebody. By different textures, I mean two voices for these two measures and four voices here, six voices there, one voice there, maybe a full rest of no voices, all that kind of stuff. So that's got to be placed in each one of those 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 little, where did I put it? There it is. I mean, these guys are down to the floor with information in them about what's coming next. Is it more of the same that it has, or now we're going to change to something else? So you just have to make that, that leap with me to what you're going to hear now. This is a piece for two pianos performed by those two particular performers who apparently liked me enough to actually record it twice on two different CDs. Uh, so it's by Rock, well, it's not by Rock Marinoff. It's by Emmy. It's called Emmy Rock Marinoff from Rock Marinoff Suite.
from uh, the Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto, number five, uh, written by Emmy. The, the thing is that with Emmy, you have to be very careful what you put in the database. It has to be in the same mode, not the same key, but the same mode, meaning major or minor. You can't do both. It's confused otherwise. Uh, it has to be music of the same type, meaning same meter, that is 3, 4, or 4, 4. Or if it's multiple meters, it's all right, whatever you do, because it's not going to make that much of a difference. Um, very careful. But whatever you put in the database is what you're going to get out. So if you put SATB choir music, like Bach Corral, you're going to get Bach Corral's SATB out. If you put in symphony orchestra music with piano as a soloist, you're going to get orchestra music with piano soloist out. If you choose music for two pianos that we just heard, you're going to get that out. So right now, um, uh, at, at, well, not right now, but back in 2003, Emmy had composed uh, about 11,000 pieces. I chose 1,000 of them uh, for publication. And it was published by a publisher for a while who's then started putting them, who had to buy the music uh, uh, yeah, you had to buy that music per se, but then there was only a few pieces available. In any event, the bottom line is, I've gone ahead and published all, the, all those thousand pieces on, 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 um, uh, in score form on 
on, on uh, Amazon.com or uh, Barnes & Noble. You can buy them there, if you will. So this is an out and out. If you're curious, some of the things you'll find there is the entire well-programmed clavier. <laughs> 98 preludes, 98 preludes and fugues, or 48 preludes and 48 fugues in all the keys twice by not Johann Sebastian Bach, okay, by Emmy Bach. Or, as you'll see in the title page, if there's no worry about authorship in here, by David Cope with the help of experiments in musical intelligence, okay? You'll find a Bach concerto for keyboard and orchestra, small orchestra. You'll find the Brandenburg Concerto number no. seven. I'm outrageous and I enjoy it like hell. Uh, uh, the entire Bach, Bach output is about that thick on very slim paper, very thin paper. So it's a lot of a lot of Bach. Three operas: one on um, Mozart, one called Mozart, one called Mahler, one called Schumann. All based, all the all the readings were written by me, based on translations from the German, um, from their letters. So it's their lives on the screen. Um, composers are everywhere from Palestrina to Schoenberg, Stravinsky, and others. They range from huge orchestras to uh, to sing, simple single instruments like the cello playing the Bach Seventh Cello Suite. Um, he wrote six, of course, just like he did uh, the Brandenburg concerto. Uh, I don't think I need to go any further, given our time constraints. Uh, why did I quit? Uh, I'm a composer. And I was getting sick and tired of, of, uh, of somebody come up to me and saying, have you finished the uh, unfinished symphony by Schubert? Would you please do so? Beethoven's 10th which I did with Emmy. That is available uh, from Amazon. Um, yeah, I mean, I just got tired of it. I want to go back to composing. I want to go back to, to developing a new program called Emily Howell. I'll tell you, if you'd like to listen to some of this stuff, there's, for free, you can do so by, by tuning in the David H. Cope channel on YouTube. There are 365 videos there. Uh, some of it's my music. And some, most of it is Emmy's music or Emily Howell's music. It's all just incredibly terrific, especially my music. So I hope you go listen to that too. <laughs> but so is the Emily, and so is the Emmy. I don't have time to talk about Emily Howell. She gets the better ratings, so unbelievably. I mean, tens of thousands of people in, have seen the thing, and it's she's very popular. Uh, I also have a, a, a video of, of Stephen Israel, the great cellist, playing uh, a Mozart concerto for cello and orchestra, which doesn't exist. So I had to use uh, viola, well, violin concertos down an octave. May I ask you a question, David? That you've probably been asked a million times, but. Um, we, we, you know, we, we say there are, there are some masterpieces by Mozart, let's say, and then there are some, piece, some lesser pieces by Mozart. So taking it out of the realm of, of your own computer program's output, but just thinking about what are your opinions on why we consider some pieces by the same composer to be greater than others, or better than others, or whatever terminology Everybody you understand use. the question? The question was, essentially, if I may briefen it. Go ahead and paraphrase, yeah. Briefen? Yeah. <laughs> Make it more brief. Make it briefer. There we go. <laughs> OK. Is, why do we consider some of the composer's output masterpieces and other uh, this, the same composer's work not to be masterpieces? What makes one a masterpiece and another one not? And the answer is group preference. It's simply, it'll change, it will change. When I conducted, the first year I was at, at Santa Cruz, there was no orchestra, so I invented one. This was 1977, 78. And we did Mozart's 40th Symphony, and I worked very hard. It was, Mozart's 40th Symphony was the symphony of all time. 
hardly ever hear it perform now. Who knows, maybe it will just die away. I don't know. But there, for me, there is no great music. There is no bad music. All of that's personal taste. There's nothing about nothing that makes it any better than the same things that make McDonald's better than this this year because we've taken a vote on it. Or this person president and this person not. There is no great music except what we decide as a group to make great. And why we do that, I don't know. I guess we like each other, so we group into groups, and we, even if we're scattered across the world, we group into groups and say these things. None of it's better than any of the rest of it. It's better for us. Okay? I haven't listened to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which is, God knows, supposedly the greatest, you know, one of the greatest outside the Ninth Symphony. Every year they do votes on classical music station. That's always number one. It's always da 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 da. I'm so fucking sick of that. I can die. I hate that symphony and everything about it. Am I just screwed up? No, it's my taste. You have yours. Maybe you like it. I don't know. Apparently, a lot of people do, but that doesn't persuade me in the slightest. I don't think there is great music and ungreat music. There's just personal taste. And I believe that so profoundly that you couldn't possibly change my mind if we spent working on this for the next six months. It is just that. Nothing more. Maybe on that note, we'll... Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Having some kind of a, you're going to say yeah. something about that, uh, wherever that is. Yeah. I'll just yell. Um, we have time for one or two questions. I want to typically pa pass the mic out, but if I can't get it, then you're going to have to yell. Here we go. Oh, I can talk loud. Oh, sorry. People in the back can't hear because of the. Oh, I didn't know we were still operating. Hello? I wanted to ask if you made any pieces where you mix, like have a group of Emmy composers working together to do a piece. I'm right here. I know, but I, I'm still trying to figure out how to get this thing. What are you trying to do? I'm just trying to put it back on, and it doesn't it doesn't want to do that. So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to walk around like yeah, this. that's good. Okay. Say it again. A group of... of uh, Have you um, made any pieces where you actually mix some of these approaches? Oh, yeah. In a, in a database? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They come out stupid. They come out stupid. <laughs> yeah. They just come out stupid. There's no way to make transitions between a first beat which is Bach, and the and and second beat, which is Mozart, it's just, it's just stupid. Okay. What about um, <clears throat> using this system for improvisation? Uh, yeah, so my sec uh, I've written five books on, on, uh, on Emmy and Emily Howell, uh, uh, and that's enough. I mean, I stopped writing them in 2005, uh, in, in part because people, <laughs> some of my friends were telling me to stop. Uh, they had it. Don't know more. But the, the, the second one, which is called Experiments in Musical Intelligence, of all things, contains a recipe for building your own Experiments in Musical Intelligence. A blow by blow of building your own. Uh, the reason I don't is because I, I don't build it for you, or I don't sell it, or make it available for free, is simply that I wrote it in. And the source code is in Lisp, which I can't explain why now, but it's a, it's, it's a language that every year. Every time anybody changes any kind of, uh, of, uh, of system, uh, you know, from system this to system that, system 10.50 or whatever, to, and every time there's any kind of computer model that's changed, all the code changes. I have to change, make all. And if, you, if you're going to do that with a program that's 20,000 lines of code, you're going to spend the rest of your life just doing nothing but altering the code to get it out there, and I'm not going to do that. So. Um, God, have I answered your question, or have I just made more questions? Could it be used for improvisation with the rest? Oh, yes. <laughs> All you need is a fast enough computer to do it, and it would do it. Yes. One more question. Here's one here. here. Thank you. In your opinion, uh, what are the next promising steps in this line of research? Are there certain techniques that exist in uh, computer programming now that you think are 
suited to continuing this sort of uh, analysis and recombination of music, or um, is it something yet to be discovered yet? Oh, well, no, I think there's many things to be discovered uh, from this process. Um, and I think it can go a lot with different programming languages and, and uh, people really understanding how it works. For some strange reason, though, I've had this problem that nobody seems interested in doing that. Uh, I, I used to try to be very uh, uh, unarrogant, I guess, about it. But finally, I've come to the conclusion that the output of this program is so good that people don't want to try to compare, you know, compete with it. And that was purely accidental. I mean, I don't take any credit for it. I'm not being arrogant. It is pretty damn good. I mean, to me, I really am still moved by the pieces I've heard hundreds of times by doing this sort of thing in front of groups like you. And I'm still moved by the music. And that's just me. I'm not saying anybody else should be moved by it. Some of you maybe think it stinks. I don't care. It doesn't, bo it doesn't bother me even if it's of my own music, not this music. But I, I think that in general, though, the, the clarity of the musical output is so uh, exceptional that many people have just said, OK, Cope's doing that. That's his bag. I don't want to be caught, particularly if I'm a computer scientist and musician, I don't want to be caught doing the same thing he did. What's, what's, what's the big deal about that? But I've always thought that you know people who want to go commercial with it could go commercial with it and do something, you know, add something to it and make it. And I wouldn't demand any money or residuals or anything. All I do have a patent on some parts of this, and I guess some people who I know would probably want some money for certain things <laughs> if you broke the patent or used the patent without their permission. But that's just for certain aspects of this. Uh, yeah, I would welcome. I and mean, there. Are, there are people who have done this who've tried to do it, but they just, in the in the end, they tend to stray away because the we all want to make something that's unique, and that's not what you're doing when you copy, you follow those rules in the in in the second edition of Experiments in Musical Intelligence, the recipe of how to build this. Building it yourself is not doing anything but just building something from a you know, it's like building a radio from a schematic. What have you done? You've proved that you understand what a capacitor symbol is and what the ground looks like and all the little parts of the radio thing for electronics, but you've not built anything that somebody else didn't design. And as computer scientists, most of us want it, and, 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 and musicians and composers, we want to be known for our, for our you know, abilities to create new and interesting output and, and things to do rather than do something that somebody else has already done. That's who would pay attention to you in the first place. Because I'm pretty well known for this sort of act right now <laughs> after, you know, well over 30 years doing it, you know, 37 years now, I guess. Is that right? 36, 35 years, I guess it's been since I started the thing, so. Maybe on that note, we'll thank him again. Thank you. Well, uh, let me do. Do you have, do you, do you have some okay. Yeah. Our okay. tradition is there's reception on the fifth floor here, um, and the deal is you go down there, you can't ask him a question up here. We have to take him downstairs. We cut in line and get him a glass of wine. Right, and then I you can ask him questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So come join us downstairs on the fifth floor. Thank you, Judy. Now I'll give you some dental floss for sure. <laughs> <laughs>